welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Today is Thursday, September 7th, 2017. Can I have the roll, please? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Mrs. Starr? Here. Mr. Vashon? Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? There are two adjustments to the agenda. Item 5.5, a NEASC update, and item 10.4, middle school grade 8 science teacher appointment. Thank you. Okay, right to the superintendent's report. So I have a couple of things um, tonight, and I decided to list them here for you so you didn't have too many surprises as you prepared to come this evening. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was just to thank our community for all of your support and passing the budget on our third referendum vote. Um, we are uh, relieved to have a school budget and are already beginning to strategize for FY19. We had been doing that throughout the summer but really um, went pretty full court press this morning in thinking about what the current reality is with this budget now that we have it in place. We still have some positions that have been unfilled as we waited for the school budget to settle. And so we're looking at that and um, how we've uh, already made some adjustments and reallocations to our existing resources in order to best serve our students in the moment while also thinking forward to how do we um, work as fiscally responsibly as possible this school year. Are there any possible postponements of investments that we may be able to make with minimal impacts on our students that will help us generate um, additional fund balance moving into FY19? Because um, we know that um, although this school budget does have a 2.77% increase in our expenditures in the general operating fund, um, we had a, a challenging year in terms of revenue. And so we were starting off $209,000 below level services, um, but already have made some strategic moves to maximize our existing resources. So I really just wanted the community to know that, um, no, I'm not sleeping any better at night because <laughs> we're already thinking about FY19. But um, the school year has gotten off to a really great start, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on in my report. But thank you again for all of your support, and we are certainly relieved to have a budget. The um, next item, 5.2 AAFA resolution in support of public education. Um, this is something that was shared with you earlier in the week, and I bring this to the school board for consideration. Um, in July, AASA, which is the American Association of School Administrators, um, is the Superintendents Association, uh, the National Superintendents Association, which I am a member of. Um, and they started an I Love Public Education campaign, which is an ongoing effort to highlight the successes and opportunities of public education and demonstrate how public uh, schools develop future generations of successful students. And so AASA has put together a resolution in support of public education, which I shared with all of you. And I'm hoping that the school board would consider looking to do more around this resolution. Um, some of the things that they suggest is that we could choose to, our town or our county board, um, our school board could choose to adopt the resolution as is printed. Um, or um, the mayor or the town manager could adopt an, a version of the resolution, or we could generate um, our own community partner version that would be open to local officials, the Chamber of Com Commerce, and other local entities. And the idea is really just to rally communities around public education and to send a really strong message to our <coughs> students and to our community members that we support public education and um, we understand that there is some education policy that's being proposed right now, both in our state and at the federal level, that is undermining the rich history of our public schools and the roles that they play in preparing our students to be productive adults. And I believe um, that we really need to help lead and shape 
a broader, um, more positive dialogue around public education and, and we need to publicly demonstrate our support for public education. So um, I think that adopting a resolution like this could be one really great way for us to help our community heal after this really challenging budget process, but also help us uh, reevaluate our values and our commitment to public education. And so with that, um, I'm happy to read the resolution from AASA, but I would just want to open up for a little discussion as to how would we like to proceed? Would we like to proceed? I definitely support it. I mean, I've, for the last at least five years in my experience, the, um, I do feel like public schools are under attack, and that might be a strong word to say, but it's true. The narrative in this country has been that public schools don't work, that they're failing, and that's absolutely not true. Um, and especially in Maine, we have very few private schools and only a maximum of 10 charter schools and only nine in existence. So what are we just saying, that everyone that's coming out of Maine that we're educating is failing? Absolutely not true. Our um, schools are doing a wonderful job. Even while they're getting decreased funding and um, unfunded mandates and all the things that go along with it, um, and the um, just disrespect for educators, for teachers, the way people talk about teachers like they could do it, you, you could not. Um, if you have not been trained and had experience, it's not something you can just walk into because um, you went to school one time, um, you know, while you were a kid. Um, I've been wearing this from the National School Boards Association, I've been wearing it since the spring every day and it's fading out, I should probably try to get a new one, but stand up for public schools. Um, I feel like I have to wear it every day because I want people to see it and to think like, oh my gosh, do I need to be standing up for public schools? What's going on? And just have a little internal monologue with themselves. Like, should I be doing something more? Um, I am definitely in favor of the resolution and um, happy to entertain other people's thoughts. Jackie? Uh, I support the res resolution. I'm concerned about paragraph Six, supports the application of public school accountability systems for all educational institutions receiving local, state, or federal funding, including but not limited to virtual schools, charter schools, independent schools, home school placements. And the state of Maine at the present time is funding public virtual schools and public charter schools and not demanding the same accountability mm -hmm. uh, that is being demanded of our school districts. And uh, the homeschooling placement, I'm not certain how they're receiving any funding, nor are they accountable. So I'm only concerned about that paragraph. I support requiring uh, or, or pushing for uh, accountability, but I don't think it's achievable, quite frankly. So it's hard for me on a personal level to support something that I don't think is achievable in my lifetime. Mm. Maybe your lifetime, you're gonna mm. live longer. But. <laughs> well, I think um, one of the things that they're trying to get at with this statement is that if public traditional public schools are going to be held to high levels of accountability and fundings attached to that or um, other um, both local and federal funding dollars are attached to whether or not you receive that funding, that that should be the expectation for all forms of, of school mm -hmm. is where I think they're going with that. But remember, we don't have to we don't have to take all of this. We can take some of it. We can change the wording so that it aligns to our values and what we believe about public schools. I'm not opposed to it. I am just very concerned about it. So I will, I will support what the board wishes to support. Mary? Um, I'm also in support of it, but I, I had the same similar um, question about it as Jackie, and then I wondered, is this something, could we look at this in <coughs> policy meetings? Would that be the best place to look it over and <coughs> choose how, how to proceed with it? But I'm definitely in favor of it. I think I, I completely agree that public education needs more support and needs more, more just awareness of what, what is being done. So mm -hmm. I, I'm in favor of it. 
I think we talk a lot here about um, public ed education always changing and things, things aren't the same as they used to be when we went to school. And I think this resolution, if we could um, change it to really focus in on Scarborough for us, I think we have an opportunity in this town to sort of bring in partners. You know, let's, let's find some, some strategic partners in town that not only will help beat this drum, but will also somehow we can work with them through other things that we're doing in school and get people to see how, educa how public education has changed over even the last 10 years. Um, so I support this. I think having it go back to policy and coming back to us with some details for Scarborough specific may be the best route. Terry? Yeah, I support a re uh, adopting a resolution as well. I, we've, we've been talking about the teacher shortage that we're facing. I think that public schools and the work that they're doing can't be cheerleaded enough these days. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that by bringing more awareness to the fantastic work that's being done in our schools, maybe some of our graduates would decide they want to go into an education field mm -hmm. and maybe we can keep mm -hmm. some of our talent in education, keep that momentum. Um, and also, I think on a state level and a national level, you hear the saying that a budget tells the story of your priorities, and I think that public education has been falling and falling in the, those priorities on a state and national level, and so I think that anything we can do to bring more awareness and um, highlight the work that we're doing in, in public schools would be fantastic. And I support uh, bringing this to the policy committee. Um, certainly, you know, just in light of nationally, but I think more in the state of Maine, the recent comments, the teachers are a dime a dozen from our own governor. And, um, you know, the, the fact that there's a huge turnover in teachers. Uh, you know, people find it very hard to stay in this profession. Um, so, you know, they're gone within five years. So any effort you put into professional development or bringing them along as teachers, and then they're pretty well gone within three to five years. So it's, it's definitely a difficult field to be in. Uh, the work we do is incredible, uh, particularly in terms of, uh, in light of, you know, kinds of direction we're taking in this state, and I think only in Vermont as the only other state in the nation that is going towards proficiency-based graduation. Um, so, you know, it's difficult work, and I think. We need to champion this work. We need to come out and encourage young people to consider education as an important career. So, um, yeah, I'll go back to policy and we'll take a look at this document and check. Through the chair to the superintendent, is, is there a recommended timeline on this? So the, the goal is to, would be for us to adopt a resolu an I Love Public, ed Public Education resolution sometime this fall. And the idea is that creating mass and numbers so we can leverage this um, unified voice on Capitol Hill as some as significant policy decisions are in the pipe to be made in the next, in the upcoming year. Um, and one thing I would suggest or uh, at least put out to the board to consider is that I think um, for us having strength in numbers and thinking about bringing in our town council and our town manager and our community business partners mm -hmm. um, to, to have a really shared voice on this I think would be a really positive uh, win for our community as well. And part of what AASA has asked is that we share with them how we're doing this work. So um, with your permission, or your blessing rather, I would, um, I would like to start connecting with them and say that this is something that Scarborough is interested in doing and they might have some additional guidance for us as well. Yeah, sure, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Do you need a motion f to have it go back to policy? I don't think so. Okay. I think it will come back from policy and then be adopted with motion. Yeah. Yeah, it's not an action item. No. Okay. Thank you for your support in that. That really, I think, is a huge step forward for us. 
Um, so just a quick back to school update. I have had a chance to get into many classrooms in the few short days that we've had so far. Um, I was at Eight Corners this morning, um, and it's always my favorite because you never know what those little guys are going to say to you. And so I was in um, Mrs. Golachek's classroom, and one of the little boys said to me this morning, "Who are you?" <laughs> he stood right up while the teacher was talking and giving directions and then I started talking with him and we had a lovely chat all the way down to the lunchroom and then back because he forgot something um, and then I also have been able to get into the middle school today and I was at the high school for a little bit as well um, one of my goals this year is to have um, not only the 100 school visits in 177 days like I did last year um, I just barely met that goal so my I want to exceed it this year, um, but I also have a goal to visit every single classroom in the district before the end of the school year, and I think I've already been in at least 25 classrooms, and you know, my not to evaluate all the teachers, but just to be in there and to hear how they're talking to their students and see the learning in action. And um, I really should have sent Keith an email, but I'm just, I keep telling the world about what I observed when I was in his classroom because um, I'm so proud of the PBE work that we're doing in the district and um, at the high school, especially the way our teacher leaders have stepped up to fill a void and not being able to bring in the improvement strategist to support them this year. Um, but I popped into Keith's classroom and I believe he had a freshman class because I recognized um, some of the students from the middle school last year and he was explaining to them very clearly and very transparently what the learning goal was and how that each learning target was going to help them get toward meeting or exceeding that goal and how they would know exactly where they are in their learning all the time and that he would know and if for some reason they weren't making pace of progress out that they expect or he expects that there would be interventions in place to support them and it just was I probably had like the biggest smile on my face and um, that was on Tuesday morning so I'm thinking all that positive energy is what channeled our success with the vote. But um, it's just really great to see that uh, you would think that we've been in school for a month when you go into the schools. The routines are down. Um, the, the principals are out and about in their buildings and making connections with their staff. And the kids are um, just really soaking it up. So it's been a great start to the year. I think each phase level has had a pretty smooth transition and um, I'm just so proud of the work that we're doing. So I wanted to share that with you and um, also while at Eight Corners, um, Mrs. Gosselin's class <laughs> planted a butterfly bush this morning and so they uh, have caterpillars in their classrooms and I believe one of one of the teachers, they already have a butterfly, so they were getting prepared by planting this new bush in the flower bed out front and so proud to be getting their hands dirty and, you know, their teachers out there in a suit and, you know, digging the hole and they were all um, helping plant the butterfly bush. So lots of exciting things happening. You would, like I said, you would think that we've been at it for quite some time and it's only been a few days, especially for the little ones. So really great stuff. And... Um, with that, I'll share a little bit about our enrollment numbers. One of the things that we've um, been doing uh, all of last year and will continue into this year is giving monthly enrollment reports, and typically I like to do that at the end of the month. But I think it's interesting to notice how enrollment changes from what we project back in April um, and then how that refines over the summer to what actually um, is happening when we open school doors in August. And so um, when I'm looking at the enrollments by grade level, by phase level, there's been lots of change just from the end of August to today, September 7th. Um, so at the high school, uh, we've had, at, in August we had 961 students, and today we have 953 students. At the middle school, we started with 713 students, and today we have 712. Mm -hmm. at, 712 Thank you. at the middle school um, and this is all available on our, our website um, under the superintendent's page all the time too. Um, at Wentworth we started with 671 students and now we have 681 students today. Um, at Blue Point we started with 178 and now we have 175 students. At Eight Corners we started with 225 and now we have 222. 
and at Pleasant Hill we started with 168 and now we have 167. So overall in August we had 200, um, 2,916 students enrolled and today we have 2,910 students enrolled. And you can see how it doesn't all happen in one grade level or in one building. Um, and so that's, you know, part of our staffing challenges is really managing all of that um, fluctuating enrollment and being prepared for um, kind of the unknown and the unpredictable. The one thing um, I also did in the online enrollment report, if you click across the tabs at the bottom, I did a multi end of year analysis. So I looked for the last three years at the end of year June data. Um, which if you can go back and see the previous years as well. And then I showed if, if you scroll down, um, you'll be able to see, I should probably be showing this, but you'll be able to see what our two long range um, projections are according to the planning decisions reports that we had done. And we are currently, even though our enrollment is lower than it has been in the past, we are outpacing the projections. And so that's something that we're keeping a close watch on um, as always. And thinking about already, you know, what is, what are some of the smaller class sizes coming up mean in terms of shift of staffing and things like that as we start to work on the FY19 budget. So that's my um, last piece of my report. At this time, I would like to ask our principal of the high school, David Creech, to come up to the podium and talk to us a little bit about what's going on with NEAF. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you an update for NEASC and um, it'll be unusually short for me tonight uh, due to the impending competition at 8.30 that I think most of you are aware of. <laughs> um, and I have the Patriots colors on my sheet just to get in the right mood. So I want to start by also thanking uh, Superintendent Kuchenberger for recognizing the efforts of our teacher leaders at the high school last spring, this summer, and this fall. I think it's been a tremendous start to the school year, and I think our staff is going to work very hard this year to begin that transition into the PBE model, so thank you for recognizing them. Um, there are some save the dates that I want to share with you regarding the NEASC accreditation process this year. As you know, last year we completed our self-study, and the next phase of the accreditation process is a decennial visit by a visiting committee comprised of 16 educators, mostly from the state of Maine and New England, um, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, Maine, and I think there were a few from Vermont. <clears throat> we have a chair of the committee that's been selected. That's Gregory Myers, who is superintendent of schools for Millbury Public Schools in Millbury, Mass. Uh, he and I have been communicating over the last couple of weeks in preparation for the site visit. Uh, assistant chair for that committee is David Walker, who is the superintendent of schools for Old Town High School, or Old Town mm -hmm. School District, I should say. Um, important for you to note would be the opportunities for you to be involved in this process. So I'm going to give you a few dates that you're going to want to mark down on your calendars. The first date is uh, September 18th is a pre-visit that happens at Scarborough High School, and it's where the chair comes and meets with me and the steering committee and we go to uh, the local accommodations that were put up for them and they check out the lodging and the workspace and talk about meals and those types of things. Then they come to the high school and he'll meet with the steering committee and I and talk about all the different things that we have to make sure we're prepared for for the site visit. So even though we have a checklist that we've already been going through, he will go over the specifics of that to make sure that we're prepared for that visit, which is less than two months away. He will also meet with my leadership team and I and we will give him a tour of the building and give him an opportunity to see the facility and get comfortable with the workspace that they're going to have at Scarborough High School. And then he'll conclude that day by meeting with our staff at our staff meeting that afternoon and he'll give them um, kind of a, a snapshot of what's going to be happening, their role, and that happens at about 2.25 that day for the staff visit. So. Um, in terms of your role for that day, you're welcome to come to the staff meeting. Uh, if you happen to be in the school during that time, and, and I can give you when I meet with him next week the specific times if you want to meet with him when we're doing the tour, but this is really a, a site visit to prep our school for what's going to happen 
on the actual visit date. And that's the date that would probably be of most importance to you. Again, like we've mentioned in the past, it's November 5th through the 8th. So specifically in terms of the role of the board and the school community, on November 5th, what will happen that first day is their team will meet at the hotel in the morning and they'll have a meeting and then they will move to the high school to the auditorium for a panel presentation at around 1. I, ha I don't have confirmation of this yet. I'll get that confirmation on September 18th. But typically what happens is there's a panel presentation where we're asking the school community, parents, school board members, school and business partners, teachers, students, to attend that preliminary meeting. It's an opportunity for their committee to meet with our school community and we'll have a presentation that we're making for them that will last a little bit less than an hour. And then shortly after that meeting, their committee starts to break up and meet with board members during that time. Traditionally, it's right around 2 o'clock, but we'll get the specifics on the 18th. They also meet with parents who have volunteered to come in. And so really that Sunday is a day for the committee to meet with community members, board members, and parents and have those preliminary uh, discussions. And then really they're discussions about Scarborough High School, Scarborough Public Schools, and what's happening. Um, and then that night is when we'll have teacher interviews and there's a reception that happens at around 4 o'clock. It's about an hour long and it's for everybody who has participated in the activities that day. Um, and and I think something of importance for you, I, I think we've discussed a couple of times that I've been on site visits before, and we have other teachers who have. Something that we're going to work very hard to ensure happens during our site visit is there are going to be a ton of students that are going to be interacting with the committee, and basically we're going to have the student leaders and students who volunteer to be the individuals that are kind of ambassadors for the school during that day. Even though they're going to be getting into classrooms and meeting with the adults, we're going to have students available for them to shadow, to take them around the school, for them to interview, and because really the, the best and the most important part of Scarborough High School are the students. And we're very proud of them. So we think that's the best way for them to get an accurate sense of the wonderful things that are happening at Scarborough High School. So a lot of this information, once we meet on the 18th, will be shared with the school community. But November 5th through the 8th are the dates that you might want to keep free on your calendar. And when I meet with the chair, he'll give me any specifics in addition to the fifth that you might have to be involved with. Those of you who are parents of students in the system, you are also welcome to meet with them when they meet with parents. So you can do the board and the parent piece if you so desire. Um, we're very excited. We're very proud of the work that we've done. We're excited to have this committee visit us. and. Um, we're excited to show them Scarborough High School, the fantastic students we have, the talented staff we have, and the supportive community we have. So we're looking forward to November 5th through the 8th. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that takes us to the chair's report. Um, since we don't have a student here, I was trying to find the dates real fast for the open houses. Um, just to be able to share those. Yeah, I, high school is 6 o'clock on September 13th. I thought Wentworth, I saw something. Wentworth is September 19th. 19th. Wentworth. And the middle school is the 14th. Is Actually, it, is the, the middle school has two dates. Okay. The 12th is for 6th grade, and the 14th is for 7th and 8th grade. And they're all That's what at 6? But at 5.30, we uh, you know, For PBE. Right. Right. So Prior to the open house at the high school, there'll be a presentation in the auditorium um, to um, have the, it's a, not question and answer, correct? It's just a presentation about proficiency-based education. Oh, okay. So if you have questions, bring them there. That's right. So the middle school, I did see the, I wasn't making that up in my head, right? September 12th for sixth grade? Yes. For, it, sixth grade is on Tuesday, and then seventh and eighth grade is on Thursday. And the middle school is also um, creating a presentation for PBE, but they're going to do it on a separate night. Okay. Um, is that the 25th, Dave? Yes. So that's scheduled for a PBE at the middle school parent info night, 6 o'clock on Monday, September 25th. Okay. So important dates to, to get like in the calendar. Find the dates real fast on my phone. and. Um, not a lot filled in yet. Yeah. Yeah. 
I know it's been requested by the principal at Wentworth that school board people be available. Have any of the other schools requested so that? So Wentworth specifically is because they have a scavenger hunt during their open house for students. And so they were wondering early on if we were going to commit to having a table there because we're part of their scavenger hunt now because I said we're going to do it. So our table, they have to come <laughs> and get checked off. Um, but in the past, we've had school board members at open houses to collect, um, to provide information, number one, mm -hmm. and two, to um, collect email addresses if people want to stay in touch with us. Um, so we send those quarterly newsletters. Um, and so, yeah, we do have some volunteers for Wentworth, and we just haven't had the dates circulate yet to see if people are available um, for the middle school. And so we'll I'll, I'll circulate an email about that. Thank you. Um, yeah, because it is nice. We don't always get out in the public. <laughs> they, don't, they don't only see us on TV. Um, <laughs> we live in the TV. Um, they do. We're always here. Um, so another thing that we have tonight is um, a resolution that we have, um, it's been presented to us, and I thought it was a good idea, so I brought it to you about um, State of Maine is going gold for childhood cancer awareness for the month of September. Um, we already do things for in October. We do the breast cancer awareness and all our teams were pink and we have some, um, Red Storm Strikes Up Cancer and we have Pink Ribbon Club at the high school. So it's not unprecedented that we have deep connection with um, advocacy groups that are uh, supporting cancer research. Um, and as a school department, I thought it was especially appropriate that we would support childhood cancer because we certainly have had students and mm -hmm. probably currently do that um, are struggling with cancer. So um, I guess I'll read mm -hmm. the resolution and then we can have a discussion. Yes. So this is the resolution of the Scarborough School Board authorizing September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the school district to support the State of Maine Going Gold Initiative, Maine Children's Cancer Program, and Team Haley Hugs. Whereas cancer is the leading cause of death by disease among the U.S. children and is detected in more than 15,000 of our country's sons and daughters every day, and whereas in the state of Maine, cancer affects more than 50 new children and fami families annually, where more than 400 children are undergoing treatment currently, and where we are ranked in the top range of incidence of all cancers at 468.3 per 100,000 people, and whereas September is nationally recognized as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, it just shrunk on me. And whereas, thanks to ongoing advances in research and treatment, the five-year survival rate for all childhood cancers has climbed from less than 50% to 80% over the last several decades. And whereas innovative studies are leading to real breakthroughs, reminding us of the importance of supporting scientific discovery and moving closer to finding cures, though through though work remains to be done. And whereas one in five children diagnosed with childhood cancer will not survive, and whereas during National Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, we remember the many children who have been taken from us too soon and extend our support to those who continue to battle this illness with incredible strength and courage. Now, therefore, Scarborough School District hereby resolves to support the Maine Go Gold Initiative, Maine Children's Cancer Program, Team Haley Hugs and all the children and families affected by childhood cancer, and in doing so, recognize September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the school district. This action is intended to pay tribute to the families, friends, professionals, and communities who lend their strength to the children who are fighting pediatric cancer. Thank you for bringing this to us, Kelly. Thank you. Um, it came to Julie, and she called me up and said, what do you think? I said yes immediately. So makes sense to me. Um, you know, I, I have a niece who, at eight years old, uh, just a few years ago, battled um, cancer at Dana Faber, and I've also had, as a principal, a student in my school in first grade who uh, fought really hard for uh, was fighting cancer. So it makes sense. I mean, we're where these kids are. This is where they are. This is where they live. This is where they try to survive after treatment mm -hmm. in our classrooms and in our schools, uh, you know, with the enormous help of our nurses. So it just makes sense that we're supporting this. 
And that was a, a difference for me. We don't have resolutions for breast cancer awareness or um, other cancers or diseases in particular, but this one seemed like this is kids. This is an initiative statewide, so it seemed important that we do the resolution. Okay. Also, the main children's cancer program is located mm -hmm. in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. Right. right. <coughs> Mary? Yeah, I fully support it, and I just wondered, is there a plan to like have a goal day at the schools, is it, or is it more just a resolution? I didn't know like what the... At this point, it's a resolution, but I would certainly hope that our schools would adopt a spirit day this month or, you know, every September that would be uh, where goals and support. So I've been working closely with our Director of Athletics and Extracurricular, Mike Legage, um, to coordinate some efforts at the high school through um, our Red Storm Strikes Out Cancer Club that's led by one of our teachers, Lauren Bornstein, and I know that um, as soon as she learned about it, she said, this sounds like it's right up our alley, and so um, we have some things in motion. It came to us sort of at the end of August, and so I also talked with the middle school principal today to see if we could coordinate some efforts there. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, knowing our students and knowing our community, there's always something philanthropic going on in our schools. Um, so I'm looking forward to how, um, how our schools will uh, latch on to this and be proud to know that the board is ag you know, agreeing to this resolution and will have all kinds of efforts going. Um, in addition, they are also looking at doing some things with Hurricane Harvey, too, and helping different schools with that. So we'll, there will be more information coming, and we'll keep you updated into, as to what the Goal Goals mm -hmm. efforts are. I also know um, Kiwanis has worked closely with the children, Maine Children's Cancer Program in the past. So I also know that they have speakers to send out. They're very accommodating with that. If, uh, and I know the director lives in town and has a couple, I think he, his children are still preschoolers probably, but uh, they're very accommodating if, if somebody wanted them in the classroom for some reason. Good job. Okay, so since this is a resolution, we need a vote. Um, so I, I guess I make the motion. I second All the it. things I just said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, other, uh, any other comments or questions? meant to our goal tonight. I got to. Oh. I thought of it as you started talking. It's like, kills me. Mm -hmm. okay. All in Next favor. Time. Next meeting. Yeah. Thank you. That's unanimous. Great. Um, yeah, it still will be September next meeting. Solid gold. All right. That concludes my chair's report. Committee report. Let's start down here. Mix it up. Uh, I will be attending the Maine School Boards Association meeting on Saturday, and I have requested from them uh, information on uh, how they approach the vote on their school budget and if they have an advisory committee in their town, how it works. Hmm. Be good so I will have an opportunity and they thought it was a great topic to, to discuss on Saturday so I will have more information on that. Uh, we continue to uh, negotiate the bus driver's contract and I'm sure we will get back to something fairly soon. Okay. Um, I think the Communications Committee is happy to not be talking about the budget for at least a couple of months. Um, we're <laughs> going to gear up to talk about some other things for a little while, so we've scheduled our first September meeting for Monday at 2 o'clock, and we'll be starting to plan out a new newsletter and moving on. Good. Donna? I have nothing new uh, on policy. Um, hopefully we, I was going to email you tomorrow morning and see if we could get together next week because I've got a couple of things. I was hoping we could squeeze in an hour if you're all available for an hour next week. Um, but under the <coughs> school and business meeting that it will be meeting on the 14th at 7.30 in the morning at Wentworth. And uh, one of the topics that had come up at the last meeting was about taking a look at you know how, how other towns might be talking about their budget in the community and what kind of um, avenues they took. So I have from one of our high school teachers, uh, RSU-5s, 
and that is Durham Freeport and Pownall. The document that they put out that they it goes in the mail to everyone in the town with um, you know just really descriptive information that might be of use to you know the school and business community to take a look at as well as the finance committee mm. to look at so in communication. Yes. Did, do you know who? Did they say who paid for that? Is it from the school district? It is from the school district. Uh, my impression was that it did get paid for. It's kind of bulk mail. Yeah. Yes. I believe it's paid for by the school district. It is paid yes. for by yeah, the three towns. Obviously. And it's it's very similar to some of the information that we put in the big town budget mm. book, but it's in a nice um, mailer that folks can go back to and reference. And it also has some teacher stories in it, which I think is a really nice touch. That's it. Finance? Anything? <laughs> Just been sitting around. Um, so the finance committee did meet before this meeting um, and actually got back on track with um, the business of school. So we finished up, we started our conversation um, about the year end um, financials for this past year, and there'll be a presentation to the full board from Kate at our October 5th meeting. And then the rest of the meeting, we were originally going to have the town council join us because we feel like it's important to have a joint conversation with um, planning for next year already. Um, but unfortunately, schedules didn't allow it and we weren't going to have enough time. So the Joint Finance Committee will be meeting on Monday, September 18th at 6 o'clock here, I think in Chambers B, actually. And we'll be talking about what worked um, with this last budget, what ways we can improve things, things we want to do next year that we didn't do this year, and also talking about and sort of brainstorming different things that have come to us um, from community members, from staff, from whoever, just to talk about if, if it makes sense for us to move in different directions or continue the way we are. A lot, there was a lot of talk about multi-year um, projections, and so I think it's important for us to sort of all have that conversation together to find out if it's a, a useful, um, if it's the right use of our time and energy and the results that we've had in the past and, and learning from that. So there'll be a broader discussion, and, and I know the Town Council Finance Committee has done a lot of um, this discussion themselves, and so we did it at our Finance Committee, and then on, on the 18th we will come together and work through that together. And I too would like to thank the community for supporting the budget. Um, it was a long summer and I think it's important for all of us to take a, a break and a, a little bit of a breath and, and regroup and figure out again what, what works and, and where can we improve because I think a long budget cycle not only has an effect on our schools and our staff and our students but also on our community. I said that in our finance mm -hmm. committee. Meeting, I think um, long budget cycles like that have some negative consequences for the entire community. So I think it's important for us to learn from this, but also figure out ways we can um, move forward and not repeat this summer. Okay. So that takes us to 8.0, public comment on agenda items. At this point, if there are any members of the public who would like to speak on our remaining agenda items, please come to the podium, state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Seeing none, <laughs> I've closed the public comment session. And it takes us to new business, uh, 9.1 meeting minutes of August 3rd, 2017. Do we have a motion? Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions, revisions, comments? I have a comment, please. Uh, with, this is the meeting where we met, where we sat with, in smaller groups with, with the administrative group. Mm -hmm. And I would like to suggest that we make signs and hold on to them that tell what we want to preserve. And whether we hang them in the superintendent's office or whatever we do with them, I think it's absolutely imperative that those of us who sit in leadership of our school district have identified what we think is, are the most important things for our district 
besides our mission. And I, when a lot of thought went into this, and I think it's especially true when we talk about uh, priorities for our budget coming up. So I would add to that that there was also what was the middle column, Mike? What was the middle column improve. that we added? Um, improve. 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 I would Empty in every. In not every at the high school. school. The, the high, high school crowd school had some members. improved yeah. 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 opportunities. So I would I would add that to that um, poster. That'd be fine as well. I just don't want us to lose that. Yeah. Right. I thought that was an important meeting, and I thought uh, that it was productive. Okay. Just um, a little sneak preview of what we're going to do at our next workshop. We're going to be building on that, much in the way that you said, looking at our mission and our vision and um, really share, developing our collective values. So uh, those collective commitments and things that clearly stating what our values are, what it is that we believe in, and then what does that mean in terms of our commitment to our students. So I think that that's a perfect time for us to begin making those signs. Well, and it m might be in our best interest as well to ask the same questions of our staff and to ask the same questions of our parents and uh, see what they come up with. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Oh, I just wondered as far as like you were t speaking about the signs, I think that might be something for the newsletter also to, to highlight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all in favor of approving those minutes? I would. I was asking. Yeah, make, make so Mary abstains and everyone else says yes. Okay, so 9.2, meeting minutes of August 17th, 2017. Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions or comments about these minutes? All in favor? Okay. Absent. Very um, Nine point three. Facility fee waiver request. Move approval. Second. Sure. Um, so we recently, on August 22nd, received a letter from um, Robin Dams, who it works in the planning department, and she write, she's writing this letter um, requesting that we would consider waiving the fees associated with use of the Wentworth cafeteria, and this really aligns um, specifically to the resolution the board just adopted. She's hosting a fundraiser to benefit Maine Children's Cancer Program. It's a scrapbook crop. There will be mm -hmm. approximately 75 people attending. Um, this year, the event will be held on Saturday, September 30th from 9 to 5. Um, and as we talked about earlier, September is National Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, so she feels that it's very important to hold it in September. And we've waived the fee for the past seven, or the past eight years, um, and so she thanks us in the letter for our generosity. Um, and she also mentioned that um, the crops are, the scrapbook crops are very successful each year, um, la raising over twenty-two thousand dollars for Maine's Children Cancer Program. And by waiving the fee, she's able to donate all of the proceeds to the Maine Ca Children's Cancer Program. And for her her ties to Maine Can uh, Children's Cancer Program are very personal. She has a daughter who was diagnosed with leukemia in December 2003, um, and sadly her daughter passed away in January of 2006. So for two years their lives revolved around Maine Children's Cancer Center and the support that they provided. Um, not only did they try to cure her disease, but they helped support her as well as their entire family emotionally, and so this is her way of giving back. And um, she also wanted us to know where the money goes that they raise or that she raises. And so the short answer is that it goes, quote, um, towards research-based care, education, psychological services, outreach, advocacy, and new programs not covered by insurance or patient fees. Thanks for the support. Uh, thanks to the support of our sponsors, we can say that 100% of the funds that are raised by individuals impact the children and their families today, and end quote. That's a quote from the Maine Children's Cancer Program. Um, so her letter ends by thanking you for your consideration of this worthy cause and that if you have any questions about the event or Maine Children's Cancer Program that you can contact her directly and she shared her information with us. Yeah, I think that obviously we've approved it several years in a row. It's a worthy for the um, cause and use of our space and time, so um, certainly in favor of it, and it ties so nicely in with our resolution. 
Any questions or comments about this? All in favor? That's unanimous. Great. Okay, 9.4, second reading of policy IKF, graduation requirements. Can you give us a little something, Donna? Sure. So um, you had before you, hmm, probably weeks ago, the first reading of the graduation requirements, and I mentioned at that time that um, you know we continued to work on this document, but that we really wanted to have something since our freshmen will be graduating uh, and at least for with there were a few subjects in uh, when they graduate under proficiency, so we came up with this document along with the leadership at the high school, and the only thing I will mention is that you do have in front of you tonight a recommended what would be an amendment to the policy, which would be to take this amendment that's in front of you, a language that we'd like to add. And it would it be inserted on page two if you have your document. Some of you have it on your computer. Mm -hmm. But it would follow the, uh, right after the first two paragraphs. Uh, so that would be in addition to clarify a little bit better for our students and their parents exactly what is expected of everyone. So I did um, ask David if he would mind coming to the podium and speak a little bit to the broader work of the graduation policy. One of the things that we know is that this policy is going to be revisited pretty regularly over the next year um, and upcoming years because we're still missing some information from the state. So this is um, pretty bare bones in terms of what we need in order to make sure that we have clarity for our students but know that we will be revisiting this policy frequently over the next couple of years. And as Julie and Donna just mentioned, um, you know, really the state's in transition. It's, it's a transition for each graduating class coming up over the next four years. So as the document outlines, it really, you know, one, it starts by making it very clear for the families in Scarborough what the existing graduation requirements are for our 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And that was important for them to know whether the law impacted them. And so those graduation requirements are remaining as they have been, and they are a part of this policy at the very beginning. And if you look at that language, that language is similar to what we're asking be embedded into the proficiency-based diploma language because the proficiency-based diploma language is a transition to a proficiency-based education system, and it's a gradual transition. But during that time, those are minimum requirements to fulfill the requirements of the standard-based diploma. Scarborough High School still has graduation requirements that we believe <coughs> not only support that transition, but are imperative that it's clearly outlined for families and students so that they can progress through their four years or however many years it takes them to do high school. So what you see is basically similar language to what our current 10th, 11th, and 12th graders have for graduation requirements, but it captures the spirit of the proficiency-based diploma law and it guides our students on what they have to take for English, social studies, math, science, fine arts, health, PE, and all those other course requirements that we believe still should be in place for students to graduate Scarborough High School. And if you'll notice, there's, the language is still tied because we haven't really had definitive um, language at the state level as to whether the proficiency-based diploma has to be tied to credits or not. But we're feeling that Scarborough High School is going to continue to evolve. And until we have a more definitive model that's a PBE model, we are going to continue with our credits and have that be how students track progress for graduation. So it's really a tool, just like the, the tool that's in place for our 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And as we grow and, and, and this PBE model continues to transition, we down the road feel like it will be an opportunity for us to revise this as necessary. One um, additional recommendation that I would like the board to consider in the second reading of this policy is that we eliminate the language that speaks to how many semesters they must have of any given course. 
Um, David and I have talked about this, and really it's about them earning the credits and demonstrating proficiency and not about the number of breaths they take in the seat. And so there may be some students who might need a little longer to meet those requirements or some students who may be able to meet the requirements faster. So we wanted to um, be really student-centered and allow for that individualized approach to meeting the graduation requirements by eliminating the time constraints of the semester language. And that, if I can piggyback on what Julie's saying, that also aligns with our philosophy that we want to provide multiple pathways for students. So earning credits doesn't have to necessarily be a course at Scarborough High School. It can be a college course, an internship. I mean, we really want to expand possibilities for students. And as uh, Julie just mentioned, having the semesters listed there is a little bit more restrictive than we think. So just tying it to credits earned. Um, and that credit can be a pre-approved program, a college course, some of the things I just mentioned, but we want to give students more flexibility. Mm -hmm. And that also aligns with the spirit of the law where it asks for flexibility and graduation requirements so students can have multiple pathways to achieve proficiency. And that, that's, that's really our goal. So mm -hmm. removing that would absolutely support that. So removing, just so yes. I'm clear, right. removing that on this um, handout that we just got when Amendment. we came in. Yeah. And also on page one of right. IKF where it lists for our um, existing 10th, 11th, and 12th Okay, Because that was my question because I remember us talking about in the past some kids may become proficient in three years or three and a half years. It may not take them the full four years. So I worried when I saw like English eight semesters. Mm -hmm. To me, that said four years. That was very mm -hmm. sort of defined as four years. Um, so I absolutely agree with eliminating semesters. Okay. And, and the elimination of the semesters for the existing 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, um, just because they have existing graduation requirements doesn't mean we're not going to try to provide the same opportunities we're providing for incoming ninth graders. You know, uh, 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 students are taking vocational courses that are worth more credits than one. They're taking college courses, so it removes the rigidity of having it be tied to, like Julie said, seat time. Mm -hmm. It can be more tied to a course completion or an internship or something along those lines. So um, just remove those semesters, but you can mm -hmm. keep uh, the course okay. and the credits right. in place. Mm -hmm. So can I make an amendment that you have to have a motion <laughs> first? Oh. Okay, somebody make, needs to make a motion quick. Say. I move approval of um, <laughs> policy IKF. Second. Okay. I would like to make an amendment to policy IKF in that we remove um, the word semesters after um, each of the different offerings. Second. Content. Okay. Any questions or comments about the amendment? Yes. It, it, it doesn't do any good to remove semesters when you talk about includes four years of social studies, for example. It does. Uh, yes, it does. So what? Eight I, semesters equals four credits includes four years of English educational experience. Experience, but I think the different. Oh, sorry. I, I can speak to that if you like. No. So uh, it's about the flexibility we were just referencing. So an educational experience can be defined by the school. So you might have an internship that isn't necessarily tied to a semester or a full school year, but it's an educational experience that's tied to receiving credit. So um, in, in terms of mathematics, you might take three math classes in your first three years of, uh, at Scarborough High School, but then your fourth year, maybe you're taking robotics or engineering. And we determined at the school level that that's something that could also be considered a, a math credit. So um, a four years of an educational experience, the law provides us the latitude to determine what that educational experience is. And that's why um, leaving the credits in place will give us the flexibility to determine what constitutes a credit. And also there could be simultaneous classes that you're taking that would provide the credits. Yes. One way to think about it that might um, satisfy both perspectives is adjusting the language to say includes in, um, an English educational experience each year enrolled because again if a student was able to take you know extra courses through virtual high school or through a college course they might be able to obtain the credits in a shorter time frame than the four years and so that is something that I think that, that actually aligns about. better to the language of the law. 
Yeah, yeah I think that is the language of the yeah. law. Each year enrolls. Right. I'm going to vote against this. And I'm going to vote against it because every policy should be a clear policy for parents to be able to follow, for our students, our staff. And we have, I have no idea what an equivalent approved pathway might be. You have just explained it. But our students need to know what that is, and our parents need to know what that is. So if robotics is a substitute for math for some students, we should say that. Th this policy does not do what I think we want it to do. It doesn't do what I want it to do. Can I ask, are you going to vote against well, the amendment or the policy in general? Both. Okay. So part of what, why we decided to bring this policy forward right now, even though there are question marks, is because students are enrolled right now that are responsible for proficiency-based graduation requirements. So I understand what you're saying, but putting in a policy that robotics could count as math isn't policy. That's more administrative handbook, like how it works day to day. That's not policy. We just needed the bare bones of what it's going to take to graduate in a policy because kids are already enrolled and responsible for it. That piece I understand. I've done policy for years. I know. But there's nothing to back this up. There's no administrative re regulation that says what could be substituted for. Well, so there, David will talk a little bit about the communication plan that touches upon just what you're asking about. Um, and the other thing to, to think about here is that there, it literally is impossible and would be very restrictive of us to try to dream up and list every single possible combination of what this could look like. The idea is that there will be a process in place that will allow students Dylan could say, I want to I want to create an, in, an independent study that allows me to do this and this, and I'm going to intern with, you know, so-and-so and this company doing these things, and this is how I'm going to be able to demonstrate my proficiency toward these standards. And so that would have to go through a vetting process at the high school to say, like, does, is this a legit experience? Does this, does this evidence, will this evidence actually prove his proficiency toward these standards? And honestly, it could, that could look a lot, of di a lot of different ways. We're going to be creating a lot of pathways within Scarborough High School that aren't yet fully developed because we're still learning and growing. Um, and, but I do think, too, our students and our community business partners are going to be um, really critical in us being really innovative in terms of how do we make sure that these learning experiences are rigorous and relevant and what are the multiple ways that students can demonstrate their learning it could it could look really different it's much more of like an exhibition portfolio sort of model and can I just say one thing is that if you look on page three of the proposed policy the last sentence it says all students are expected to develop a personal learning plan with assistance from counselors teachers advisors and or administrators that allows them to meet expected standards at the pace and with the support they need so throughout this it says that you need to be working with the principal. If, you're, if you are involved in, um, I don't know, extensive study at the Maine State Ballet, and sure. there are instructors there, and there is some form of curriculum that you're following, like if that could count as a fine arts credit at the high school if it's approved by the counselor. So I don't think we're just throwing things into the out there to say this is we're just, we just need a policy, so we're going to throw it out there. I mean, it has all been thought through. It just, mm -hmm. those parts don't belong in the policy. So I don't think it's fair to say that there's nothing that backs it up because the work has been done, mm -hmm. in my experience and what I've seen. So I, I, think that's, I think it's a great question that she asked. So there's, there's three parts of this that, that perhaps will help. First, if you remove the new proficiency-based diploma language and you just think about past policy, so what Julie just mentioned, we currently do it. The existing graduation requirements don't go into the weeds as to what constitutes a science credit, math credit, or those other things. That's our program of studies, which our students can attest. There are hundreds of classes at Scarborough High School. 
And there are examples all the time of students coming in and saying, I need another science credit. I've exhausted these, but I would really like to do this. We are already doing what you just described. We are already working with students to allow them to fulfill a science credit or a math credit in a, in a, uh, in a method that might not be just taking a class at the high school. So the existing graduation requirements before this year were very simple. That's the first page of this policy. It just lists English, eight semesters, four credits. We have English offerings at the high school. The program of studies define exactly what that is. So to Jackie's comment, how will you know if it's a math class or a science class? Our program of studies will define that for students. It will clearly share whether this can count as a math credit or a science credit, and parents will be able to reference that. Counselors and teachers work with the students to do that. So that's why we don't go into the details of a policy, because there are just so many courses, but the course descriptions are all there. The other piece to this, I think, which Julie alluded to is, it's hugely important for everyone to realize that we're in a transition from a traditional approach to graduation to a proficiency-based education model. And schools throughout the state are following the law, but they're using their own local decision to, to figure out how does that best support the students in their community. We're doing that at Scarborough High School, too. So these graduation requirements satisfy the law. They give our students and their families direction on how to accomplish graduation requirements. But behind the scenes, we're doing the same thing we've done in the past. We're working with students and their families on unique ways for them to accomplish satisfying those graduation requirements. So we're still doing the same thing we've done in the past. As a matter of fact, we're trying to be more flexible, not just because of the law, but because we believe philosophically we should be. Funny you should mention the law. The law says that the school board has to approve the curriculum. We haven't done that. What curriculum are you talking about specifically? The curriculum for the school district. And there have been changes. When's the last time you saw a curriculum from the high school? We used to get a we used to get a list of the program of studies to approve. Didn't you guys get that this spring? Pardon me? Didn't we share that with you this spring? I don't believe so. Hmm. Well, we, uh, we received an electronic courses. You, c you can easily see that online, but um, as, as if you're talking about like a whole English curriculum K-12, is, is that what you're referring to? No, we used to get a list of the courses at the high school. We have a program of studies. We have yeah. sent that too. That's yeah. an electronic copy. Yeah, That's we got the program that. of studies. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I'm not going to, I'm beating a dead horse here, evidently. So I'm just going to back off and let you have your discussion and vote against it. Because I have, I just have this gut feeling, and I know for a fact that Maine School Boards is fighting this because uh, students in special education in some instances have no way of completing this and getting a high school diploma. Well, and we did have that as a discussion in policy um, with our special ed director, and that's why we deliberately have, have left that piece out since that's still under discussion in the it state. Is. So that's left it out. Is. And I think without any policy, if we were to not have a policy at all on this, we're kind of sending our freshmen and their families out to drift mm -hmm. on, well, what about us? What about this change we're supposed to have in order to graduate? So this was just meant to be a bare bones attempt to begin the work um, that would support the work that's happening at the high school. And it will call for revisions for the next four and maybe six or eight years Probably. as we move forward and, and understand better what this will look like in our high school and for students to graduate. But I think, you know, that's basically in front of you. It's just the, the initial structure under which we can have that conversation with parents and, and have something that the school board is backing up. And in drafting this, we specifically had that conversation that this was going to be a policy that had to be revised at least annually 
for the next four to five years. You've already done that twice this evening. And it still hasn't satisfied me. I hope it's satisfied everybody else, but I'm not okay. comfortable with this. Jody. Um, I don't think that it's a bad thing if something gets revised annually, monthly, nightly. If it, if it provides um, clarity with each revision, I'm good with that. If it provides publicity and people under getting a better understanding and hearing it more and more and understanding it more and more. This is a huge change. We've all said this for years. It's been coming down the pike for years. And a letter came home with the middle school and I saw people freaking out. What is this all about? We've been talking about it for years. So if we have to talk about this policy at every meeting to get people to realize that this is actually happening and this is what it's about and it's not so big and scary and you're child could actually do an internship and do these other pathways rather than sitting in a classroom taking a test day in and day out. Like, it's not this big, bad, scary thing that people have built it up to be. So if we have to talk about it over and over again, I'm okay with that. I think it only provides more education for the people that need it, the parents, um, along the way. And I think that the, the angst that you feel is appropriate. Um, we use the analogy in talking with the high school teachers in, at the, on the first day of school of building a plane in flight. That's literally what we're doing here. Um, but school has started. The law is in place. Policy or not, the law is in place. And so we're trying to just create a policy that gives some clarity um, without making promises that we can't deliver on or restricting us in any way that we don't agree with. Um, to the point about special education and students who have individualized education plans, this is something that we passionately, um, we believe passionately that all students should have the ability to earn a diploma. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the way that the language has been presented does not allow for that. And so we are taking caution. I encourage everyone in our community who has um, read about Chapter 134, and Allison sent to all of us some talking points to please make public comment. I, the last I heard, there had only been like 14 or 15 public comments submitted. So I'm, that was last week. I'm hoping that there's more. But this is our chance to weigh in as this plane is flying and being built. Um, and so I think what we need to give ourselves permission to feel uncomfortable in this change and um, to, for it to feel really messy, because it does, and appreciate that our staff feels this way as well. And you know, we're trying to just give them as much structure and support as they stand in front of their students, as I was explaining about Keith Magnuson earlier, talking about this work, and they stand in front of parents talking about this work. Because at the end of the day, this is the right work. This is going to improve education for our students. The logistical stuff and figuring out how to make it really scalable and replicable across districts is going to take some time as change does. Um, but I do believe that this is the, this is the right work. And um, I'm proud that we're, we're kind of going slow at it. And um, I wish that there was a model policy out there that we could have just adopted, <laughs> but there isn't. And this really came from us looking at five or six, mm -hmm. five or six different policies that are out there. And some, some districts have already you know, adopted and revised and adopted and revised. So we, um, we know that this is imperfect and that it's going to be um, adjusted and revised regularly. But what I like about this as our starting point is that it includes all students, and I think that's really important. I will say, too, that I sometimes feel like as, as a lot of change that it's hard for us as adults. The kids have a much easier time with it. My daughter's already mm -hmm. come home from school in the few short days they've had, and they have their expectations laid out in all of their classes on the first day. They're sophomores, so this doesn't, they don't have to graduate with the new requirements, mm -hmm. but one of their electives is a multi-grade class, and that is going to be graded with proficiency-based standards. So they were kind of like, this is a cool new thing, and, and like mm -hmm. not freaked mm -hmm. out by it at all, mm -hmm. which I assume is probably a common reaction from kids because <laughs> they're still going to be doing the work they've been doing. It doesn't change how they learn. It just changes how, they, how it's reported, how a teacher gives they them feedback. 
the, the policy before you provides the structure our students have to have to plan. Mm -hmm. They have to sit down. They start their freshman year. Mm -hmm. And these two can attest to this. They're looking at, okay, how do I satisfy my graduation requirements? And also, how do I take those courses I'm really passionate about? And how do I broaden my horizon? We have to have a structure for them that allows them to be able to plan for each year. Right. And this allows them to have the structure in place to guide them, but it also allows the flexibility to grow. And finally, it abides by the law, the proficiency-based diploma law. So it is a starting point, and I appreciate what you said because as our teachers are growing our proficiency-based education model, they're going to be giving us feedback on the reality of implementing it and how it will work best for our students because that's our priority. And that might require us to shift our thinking as, as, we, as we implement this. But this really is a foundation for their graduation requirements, and we have to have it for them. I'm really excited about this. I think it's really great, and um, I can't wait to see what Scarborough students do with it. I can't wait to see what my own kids do with it. Um, and it actually feels really familiar to me. I went to a college where there were no requirements. Um, there's no core requirements, there are no grades, there were no tests and um, every student wrote their own plan. They formed um, a committee of professors who were their plan team, and um, in every sophomore year, junior year, senior year, you would have to meet with your plan team, review where you were, what direction you wanted to go, you wrote your own major, you decided what you wanted to do, and you fulfilled the requirements that you and the plan team had decided on together. So to me, this feels like coming home. It feels fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see what this looks like in public school because this was not what my high school was like, that's for sure, but it is what my secondary education looked like and mm -hmm. I think it'd be really exciting. So I Dylan and Maya are like, where? I know. <laughs> <laughs> All these emails, where do I have yeah. to go to college for that? Vermont. Of course, Vermont. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't mind this conversation that we're having a debate and there's no, I mean, it's okay. new, it's different, and it's, but it's good. It's providing more education. We're going to, it's like, we have the opportunity at the high school before open house to have some more questions answered and at the middle school. And I think as we become more fluent in the conversation with parents and students, it's not going to seem so weird in just a, a few, few short weeks probably. Um, anyway, so all in favor of the amendment <laughs> first. One, two, three, four, five, right? Because we're six now. Five, okay. So then back to the main motion. Any other comments or and, and saying sorry? Uh, opposed? One. Okay. So then now back to the main motion. Are there any other questions or comments about the policy in general? We kind of already just did hash that out. Um, Okay, all in favor of the main motion as amended. Okay, five, and opposed, one. Okay. Takes us to 9.5, high school donation, photography equipment. So speaking about creating new opportunities for students um, and thinking creatively about how we deliver education, we recently were approached by a gentleman who wanted to donate some pretty fancy camera equi equipment photography equipment to our high school and so um, he has gone back and done some extensive price checking. Um, we're really excited to receive this equipment um, but he did go back and do some price checking to total the value because we knew that it was high quality stuff and he came up with a grand total of $747 for um, <coughs> three pieces of equipment. There was one um, or three types of equipment this is not my area of expertise, so bear with me, but one Bessler 23C and larger for $300, one Ditro 23DGA color head with power supply and stabilizer power supply for $297, and assorted negative carriers for $150, leading to the total of $747. Um, everything that was donated is completely operational and um, it did not include a lens board and a lens, but we're really excited to receive this equipment and see what our teachers and students are able to do with it. So Would thank you to... the donation? Oh, second. Any other questions or comments? With thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. That's a big donation. It is. All in favor? 
six. Thank you. And that takes us to appointments. 10.1, high school fall coaches. Okay, so we have um, a list here in your packet of our high school coaching positions. Uh, I'm happy to read them if you'd like, or you can read them as listed, uh, a variety of coaches um, that will serve both our uh, male and female athletes. Take them all together? Take them all together. Yep. Do you have a motion? Uh, move approval. Second. Any questions or comments about the list? Okay. All in favor? Six. Thank you. 10.2, middle school fall coach. Um, yes. I would like to recommend Steve Pelletier for, as the girls cross-country coach at the middle school this year to be funded out of the general fund. Move approval. Second. Any questions, anything? Okay. All in favor? Six. Can I just add one point of clarification? Sure. Um, when you look at the high school coaches that are listed here, just I want to bring your attention to the funding source for each of these because you'll notice that several of them are funded through boosters. So um, I just don't know if everyone in our community knows that um, not all of the coaches are funded through the general operation uh, operating budget. Mm -hmm. And so if you look down the list there, um, I believe there's three that are booster funded and then a couple of volunteers are, as well, actually more than three, one, two, three, four, five, five booster funded and um, a few volunteers as well. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay. <clears throat> 10.3, uh, motion to appoint the superintendent of Scarborough Public Schools. So moved. Second. So this is something we have to do annually for the state. Mm -hmm. It's just a technicality that we need to reappoint the superintendent every year. Um, do you have any questions or comments? I thought we did it in January. Um, I, I don't know, but here's the form. It's for the 2017-18 school year. Yeah, I think it's done in the fall by January, by January. Mm -hmm. So are we going to say yes? <laughs> I think so. She didn't even give a speech to tell you why. She didn't seen it tonight. She's done a good job telling herself, so I suppose we'll give her another year. I think she has done an exceptional job for a first-year superintendent. <laughs> no training wheels. <laughs> didn't have we time. warned you. We warned you. You saw the Google. <laughs> All right. Any, any other questions or comments? Are we ready? All in favor? Six. Yay, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like you never left. Okay. 10.4, <laughs> middle school grade eight science teacher, one year only. And the jokes are free. Yep. Um, <laughs> so we, I would like to recommend um, Adrian Hansen. Um, well, Adrian Hansen has been nominated to fill this position created by a resignation. Very late in August, we learned that um, one of our science teachers was going to another nearby district, um, but uh, we interviewed several candidates and Mrs. Hansen has been nominated to fill the position. She earned her bachelor's degree from Bowdoin College in biology. She completed her student teaching at Casco Bay High School in Portland where she worked as a ninth grade science teacher. And she also has, um, quote, in her interview she said to me, I know nothing but PBE. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, the good thing about hiring, um, n you know, new to the profession teachers. That's all their training has been in. So Mrs. Hansen will be, or Ms. Hansen will be placed on step one of the bachelor scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Adrian Hansen as a middle school grade eight science teacher for one year only. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? Just want to clarify why it's just one year. Did you say that? Um, I think past practice has been when we hire so close to the start of the school year to offer a one-year contract, um, but so long as she is a stellar teacher and um, enrollment remains stable, um, we would consider offering her another year contract. But the reality is that all teachers, all probationary teachers right. are really year-to-year, -year, mm -hmm. so um, that's just a, a past practice that we have here in Scarborough and have continued forward with. Can we vote on that one yet? All in favor? <laughs> Six. Thank you. And I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So no. moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you. We're adjourned.